<laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Whole Body Healing Podcast with me, Georgia Gray. I have such an awesome guest, one of my great friends um, and colleagues, Dr. Mara Segal, specializes in working with couples, anxiety disorders, and has the unique niche of working researchers, academics, as well as those who lived abroad. Her therapeutic work is rooted in cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, internal family systems, IFS, and psychodynamic therapy. She is warm and open-minded, allowing her clients to have a safe space to open up. Prior to becoming a therapist, Mara worked as a researcher at Harvard Medical School, University of Pennsylvania, and as a Fulbright scholar in Budapest, Hungary, studying psychotherapeutic interventions for anxiety disorders and personality disorder disorders. Her work has resulted in 20 over 20 publications in research journals and popular science magazines. She lived in Europe for five years and travels often abroad in order to engage in several cultures. Hi, Mara. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> thanks for being here. It's so, it's like so funny to I feel like I know you more as a, a friend than a therapist. And then to hear your <laughs> bio, I'm like, dang, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we get to know each other actually professionally. And yeah, um, <laughs> I'm excited. Not to our see. like collaboration side of things. So <laughs> I, I love it. Well, for people listening, um, I wanted to have you on because I just find with every single client I sit with, like it's just never as simple as food. And a lot of times, our relationships, whether we're in one or people are single or however it is, can just really affect people's eating patterns and how they feel about themselves. So I'm just really excited to jump in with you today. But first, tell us a little bit more um, about you, about your story, what you do, how you got to where you are today. Yeah. So um, I kind of I started this whole journey before being a therapist as this researcher. And I was like, OK, I'm going to figure out everything. I'm going to study. I'm going to learn. But unfortunately, though, it's a pretty fun journey. You don't get to engage directly with the clients. So I said one day I just came home um, from doing some therapy. I just saw a couple clients in, in Hungary where I was living. And I said, OK, I want to be a therapist. And I told um, I came home and I, I, I told those around me that, you know, I, I need to go ahead and I need to do it. So I just kind of picked up, I was living in Hungary and, um, my family and I moved to the U S uh, back to where I grew up. I've been living in Hungary for five years at that time and just kind of hit the ground running. And I started working in a group practice, um, in Boston and kind of like worked with a lot of young professionals, worked with couples a little bit, but really it was just this niche of working with 20 year olds who are just navigating relationships, this really hard thing of the life around you is just changing what we mm -hmm. thought that a relationship would be even for me growing up. And of course, obsessing over my middle school and high school crushes <laughs> um, to me going ahead and, and seeing that you really have to work together as a team and you can't be kind of these two separate entities in a relationship you have to come together and be I guess let's say a unit or you have to work together and find kind of that niche and that match for who you're looking for and sometimes we say okay this person is perfect this person's a great fit but at the end of the day they're not they're kind of lacking those needs that you need to be looking for instead of what you think you need to be looking for so the funny thing was that after that, my husband got a job in Arizona um, and, and he's from Hungary originally. So he had never lived in the U.S. And we um, kind of just said, OK, where are we going to go next? We moved to Arizona. And then I had started doing telehealth with my Boston clients and said, OK, you know what? I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to do telehealth. And then within, I don't know, maybe two months of starting, uh, I all of a sudden dealt with everybody's you know needs that we all experienced which is that we had to go forth with COVID and kind of navigate that mm -hmm. alone and um, I started working on my own in Denver um, working kind of doing telehealth getting licensed in Denver um, and then finally just moved to Denver and now I I don't really know what happened but I started a group practice and there's kind of I guess there's like 10 of us now um, and we all have these random different niches. So mm -hmm. I'm like this relationship, anxiety, um, cultural differences, researcher side of things. And then I have someone working with trauma, 
kids is another person, um, anxiety disorders, shame, domestic violence, just mm. kind of all over the board. So we collaborate together and we say, okay, well, we have all these differences. How can we go ahead and just apply to a relationship? How can we go ahead and help each other kind of learn from each other? So mm. it's become, I guess, kind of looking at it full circle to say that I had this idea, okay, I'm going to be a researcher. And then now I've brought those research ideas and we have created our own little lab, so to speak, or our own little place yeah. where we collaborate in our own way. So that's where I'm at. It's a really interesting journey. I don't know uh, half the time what I'm doing as a business owner, but <laughs> I think that that's what's exciting you about knowing Georgia is like we can just bounce ideas off each other. But yeah. That's, That's, I guess, where I'm at. <laughs> so amazing. I was going to say, I was like, we're, I need to have you back on to talk about like your business building and scaling, but that's for another time. Yes. Um, <laughs> so cool though. I mean, that's like so amazing. And um, yeah, so I know you have like a specific like niche when you work with couples. So I'm curious, just like in general, when people are in relationships, like what tends to be some of the most like common miscommunications or, mm -hmm. you know, tension or however you want to phrase it? Yeah. So I think the biggest is that we both in relationships um, with friendships as couples, as whatever it is, is that we sit there and we go, okay, we have to work things out and have our needs instead of acknowledging the fact that our partner has needs that equally have to be met. And that if our partner has those needs met, then we're able to go ahead and have our needs met by working together. So there's this mentality that I bring into therapy, which is to say that we need to work together as a unit. So let's say that you, I mean, even from a lower level, go ahead and you talk about what to eat for dinner, which is a very common thing in American culture, because we have a thousand different international food options in the <laughs> packaging society. Um, <laughs> so just say your partner really wants to eat Mexican food and you really want to have Italian food. You have to decide in that moment, is my partner's needs more important or are my needs more important for that Italian versus Mexican food? Does my partner have a 10 with needing that? Do I have an eight? That's a lower level. Mm -hmm. But then going forward. And if we look at communication, just say your partner has a strong boundary that I need to, let's say, not talk about what's going on day to day. I need to just have some space at the end of the day, but you really need to talk, but your partner has that in a 10. They say that I really need this at the end of the day. And you say, I don't really need this. It's important, but you have an eight, let's say. It's important to give into your needs of your partner. And then things will kind of shift. It's always going to be kind of a balancing game. Mm. Always looking at things that, how can we do things together? Instead of saying that we're independent entities with needs met, we have to have our needs met as a, as kind of a unit. And then with that, you know, you can still live those independent lives, have different friends, have different ways to fill your buckets and have those different experiences. But that's what strengthens the relationships leads, you know, you to be a good parent, leads mm -hmm. you to be a good um, partner, all those different things. So I think it's kind of something that's missing today. And also we don't yeah. really know how to talk anymore because yeah. we're, we're always on our phones. We're always in another world when we're we're present. We're always thinking about different things. In America, it's always about how can we advance versus how can we just be present. I mean, yeah. I I noticed that's a big <laughs> guilty. One. Like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, me too. But mm -hmm. how it's we're always in the future instead of the present. Yeah, our relationships aren't you know, but it's difficult. Um, yeah, so it's kind of navigating those. I would say. Yeah, and I love what you're for those of you listening and not watching, like just kind of doing that, like seesaw balancing. Act, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. like, yeah, that's like a great kind of give and take. Um, and that kind of brings me to my next question that you were just kind of alluding to, like, and I'm sure this is a deep, long topic, but just kind of, you know, it was how do, how do we communicate that? Like, how do we communicate our, our needs in a relationship? Yeah. So I think the hardest thing is that we all have all of our many, let's say, um, experiences growing up with our parents, with our school relationships um, from, let's say, elementary school, preschool, all the way until high school, college, and all of this. And then all of a sudden we say, okay, those relationships are what influence us to have a successful kind of um, romantic relationship. And then we say, okay, this is how it needs to be. But that 
does not mean that that's what you need. And I mm -hmm. think that that's an important thing here to think about is just because I think that I need something, mm. it doesn't mean that number one, my partner is going to be able to give it to me. And that's not bad. And number two, that your partner is going to go ahead and understand what those experiences are. So I think it's important to understand that your partner has good intentions. Like they're in the relationship with you to trust you and to be with you. And you have good intentions about them. You may get annoyed with them because they didn't do the dishes or they're not listening to you and, and all these different things. But that doesn't mean that they're not good. And that doesn't mean that they're not there for you, which I think is the hardest thing is we're like in a relationship and we think our partners are out to get us, but yeah, they're not, they chose to be with you. And if those needs can't be met, you know, maybe that's something in our relationships to think about and why we're in toxic relationships is saying that, okay, I think this is what I need, but what do you actually need? And why is your feelings not that important mm -hmm. or not equally, or let's say even something to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's what I kind of explore is like, just saying what you need to say, what's the worst that's going to happen? Yeah. You may have all these ideas in your mind of, okay, if I go ahead and I say this, my partner is going to leave me. Right. But you don't know unless you kind of have that conversation. If your partner's going to leave you, maybe they're also not a good fit for you to meet those needs. True. True. And so with that too, you know, do you think it's important while you're in a relationship to be doing this work on your on yourself as well and and what does that even mean to do that work on yourself too so that you can yeah. show up in that kind of balancing act we were talking about? Yeah, so I think one major thing is just not being afraid of social norms and not being afraid of also doing individual work um, by going to therapy, let's mm -hmm. say, going to a nutritionist to talk mm -hmm. about if there's any, you know, eating or chemical backgrounds that are influencing why you are the way you are, right. talking about the, the different experiences you've had separately, but also coming together. I mean, one thing I, I always say to my clients is, just because you come in and you think that, okay, I need to do this. I need to, to not talk about this. I need to not trust people. I need to not do these things. It doesn't mean that just because your mind's creating this thoughts, you have to give into it. And that's yeah. what's important for a relationship is saying that, okay, I need to go ahead and be okay with sharing. How important is it to advance that relationship is also making that decision. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of comes up in different ways. So doing the individual work. And I also want to say one thing is that we all kind of have our own, I would say traumas. There's yeah. different levels of trauma. They say that in the research that there's a, a little T trauma and a big T trauma, the big T being, you know, more catastrophic events and the little T being little experiences that you have day to day that really deeply affect you that sit with you and those are equally important so kind of realizing that you all go through things in your own way and you need to talk to your partner and you need to explain things um that's a big one as well mm -hmm. it's like so simple but not <laughs> yeah <laughs> like it just seems like oh yeah you just need to say things but I don't, it's it's so much harder in the moment yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and so now thinking of, oh, sorry, do we say something? No, no, it's just, I'm going in a convoluted loop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to ask too, for people who maybe are single and they're like navigating the dating scene and, and all of that, what, um, what are important, and I'm, and I'm sure for some people it's different for everyone, but um, from like your professional opinion, what are some like red flags to really look mm. for? when people are, are dating? Yeah. Well, I find one thing is that people, a lot of times, well, I would say in today's kind of generation, the, what we're seeing is that app, apps are where people are meeting. And right. that's, that's great because you can really deeply get to know each other, really talk before going on a date. It's right. not just having to be about a, let's say a hookup culture, but it can be about really deeply getting to know someone. It can be that too, but right. I would say the biggest red flag is when people try to meet what they think that their future partner is going to want mm -hmm. instead of, of putting forth who they are, because you're not going to find a partner who's going to be able to meet your needs. If you're just trying to 
they say this is mind reading or or mentalizing, which is imagining that other people have have a specific intention or hyper mentalizing, which is imagining somebody has a specific intention, but you don't know what their intention is. So a lot of times what we see is that people will put together these dating apps that they think people want to see instead of oh, who they are. That's um, so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And then what happens is you go on the date and then you're like, Hey, I don't vibe with this person, but maybe they're, they're super handsome or they're really beautiful. And then you're like, okay, this is, this is what I want. I put together a yeah. good profile, but then later on down the road <clears throat> years, you know, even a couple months, even a couple dates, you're seeing like, okay, I don't really vibe with this person, but I really thought I wanted to. So yeah. with that, your needs aren't going to be met if you're not really being your authentic self in the beginning. And that's, what's important too, is to be going back to the red flag question is what, um, my partner, what my kind of, um, the person I'm on a date with is wanting to communicate to me may not be what I want to communicate about, but I might have this idea that they're perfect. They fit society. Yeah. I want to be liked. I want to be viewed. I want to post on Instagram a nice picture of this, you know, relationship. I want other people to validate me, but external validation is 10 times um, less important I would say it's very important, but it's not as important to this internal validation, which is just being confident, being truly to yourself. Um, mm. And then once you're true to yourself, you kind of let go of what those expectations are, what the lack of authenticity looks like. You're able to kind of go forward and say, okay, what do I really need? What do I want to do? Um, mm. So I would say those are the three things is kind of being yourself, yeah. being authentic, not imagining what other people think, like kind of just being in the moment. Um, and not worrying about what you have to put on social media too. Yeah. So those are the big ones and they're super hard. Well, and I like though, how you're coming at it from, which I guess is why you're good at what you do, but like coming at it from the perspective of like, here's what you need to do in, in yourself as you're navigating this. Um, that's super helpful. And I hear this so often from my clients of like struggling to like, I, I hear what you're saying with communication when you're in that relationship, but with someone, you know, you've maybe gone on two dates with, like, how do you suggest the same thing of just speaking up? Like, I think a lot of people I talk with of all ages, like just struggle with like, well, he's not my boyfriend or she's not mm -hmm. my girlfriend. Like, is it still just the same thing of communicating directly in that phase of things? Yeah. Well, and I would say, absolutely, it's about communicating directly what your needs are kind of from the beginning. I mean, not going in and saying that I need you to tell me how many people you've slept with, how many ex ex partners you've had, like going in, because that's going to be too direct and that's going to scare your potential partner away. But just kind of feeling it out and being yourself um, yeah. is important. And then I think that that answers that question of how authentic are you? There's, there's also this other aspect to it, which is that the cross-cultural element to it is that we live, I mean, at least in the US, we live in a very heterogeneous society. Mm -hmm. So you may think like going back to this hyper uh, mind reading, you may think that you know what your potential partner is thinking, but they might have a whole history of different cultural backgrounds that they may be second generation American, first generation American. Yeah. They might be not even from America. They might be raised by immigrants and those things are going to affect how they communicate. So kind of recognizing and giving people, let's say the benefit of the doubt that mm. they're not going to they're not going to be meeting always your needs, but that's something that they can learn. It's not always going to be like this. Also patience, mm -hmm. but those are what makes, you know, what make relationships so cool is being able to learn so much new and, and really change yourself because you realize what are things that work better. Right. And what about on the other end of things, um, maybe working too hard? Like why do we often settle? Yeah because we think, I think we think nothing's out there. We think we're afraid of what other people think. Like a lot of times we're in relationships with our high school sweetheart or our college sweetheart, or we're with people because we think that that's what those around us are going to like. We think our parents are going to love them. We think that our friends are going to love them. We think that society is going to love them. If I walk down the street with a well-dressed man, then okay, I'm going to get yeah. a lot of 
uh, recognition. I'm going to put it on Instagram or Facebook. I'm going to get a lot of, you know, likes or whatever it is, but you, that settling is kind of what's a common American value system versus what's internally a value system that you want. Mm. And then later on, you found this lack of happiness. You have kids, you um, try to navigate the world together and it's not what you thought it would be. And then that's, I think that's also why we have a um, higher rate of those staying with partners they don't wanna be with. There's a fear of what people will think. There's a fear of rejection, abandonment, people pleasing, Mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's more about, it, is it like a like a subconscious fear of what other people will think yeah what other people will think or this this kind of um catastrophizing or I imagine that this is going to happen wow. yeah. even though maybe it won't gotcha and with that how what are kind of like I don't know feelings or flags or things for people to pay attention to Mm -hmm. to know when it's time to leave a relationship. Um, Is there anything that people can, that you've seen helpful to identify? Yeah. Um, How much are you not your authentic self in that relationship? How much are you feeling not heard? Mm -hmm. Um, How much are you, I mean, I hate to really say this, how bored are you? (laughs) (laughs) Like, if your partner's making you bored and not stimulating you enough, like you're going to find, I think also you're going to spend less time with them with yeah. the exception of people who want to be like really independent and just have a couple of meetings a week with your partner, which is okay. Right. But you know, if they're not catching those needs, that's a big one. You've talked about it. You've worked on it. You've sent texts about it. You've called each other. You've done everything to try to make it work, but they can't fill it. That's not anything bad. That's just, maybe you yeah. need a better fit. Yeah. You know? And then on the other, so like that would be if just you're not a fit, but what about when it's like a super toxic situation, like mm. getting out of those situations. And then with that too, like how, how do you rebuild yourself after that? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think a lot of people get into those toxic relationships because there's a ton of hope. There's a ton of hope that things will get better. People can change because maybe you've seen 10% of this really high, they they call it a dopamine uh, rushes. So they feel that those dopamine rushes are going to come back. It's as humans, we love the unpredictability. We love the part where it's like, things are going to go up and down and it's great. But that the long level of having, you know, they say oxytocin or the, the endorphin rush of creating a family, creating a community is going to be something that stands longer versus kind of getting those quick relationships that a toxic relation or quick hits, so to speak, that a, that a toxic relationship gives. There's a, there's a common thing that we're seeing um, in the, in like the research literature and also in therapy that's going around is this narcissistic abuse where we're finding it more common in men that these men maybe have had um that men are causing it is is what they'll do is they just want to have many women they they kind of have a lack of empathy usually tied with personality disorders and they say okay i'm gonna make this woman feel good but you know what she did one thing that made me upset so i'm gonna bring her down i'm gonna lie to her i'm gonna do everything because i think that this woman or whoever it is isn't that important that always comes with also you know, feelings of abandonment growing up, lack of attachment growing up. And then they bring it to their partners and they say, okay, well, I don't really care about this person because I was never cared about. So Mm -hmm. noticing those red flags, I think of those, um, I would say these dopamine rushes instead of stability, Um, feeling and not feeling like your authentic self, noticing you're chasing things, noticing things that you're changing. So just I guess for the listeners and for you, like narcissistic abuse is when you get into a relationship um, and you imagine it's going to go really good. They do these things called love bombing where they're like, oh, you're so great. You're so beautiful. I've never met anything, anybody like you. And then all of a sudden they have these high opinions of you and then you don't meet that because you're human and vice versa. They don't meet it because they're human. And then when you don't meet it, they automatically discard you. I don't need that, but you're still attached to that love bomb because that's so intense. Right. 
drawn to it. We want that. We want that attention and affection because we haven't had that. Yeah. But um, that doesn't mean it's sustainable. And that's also teaching, you know, women to say that, you know, things are going to work out. Things are going to be okay. I mean, and I do realize that that's um, hard to identify, but I think more literature, more teaching in schools about abuse, domestic violence, Mm -hmm. um, identifying those red flags. I mean, we have nothing in school that talks about how to have a successful relationship. And then what we're seeing is in lower, you know, socioeconomic status homes, or even in, in higher ones, what you're seeing is that people are not seeing these strong um, attachments because those people need to focus on other things, whether it's getting by day to day, or if it's getting by day to day and feeling like, I don't know, I'm bored, I need more stuff like that. So kids are not needing to have, you know, successful relationships in order to be later authentic with their partners and get it back. Hmm. Just hard to get. Yeah. And why do we like that unpredictability? Like, is it just like, because it's a rush. Yeah. I mean, if you think something um, and you really want something and then you don't get it, you're like, I still need to get it. I always tell my clients this example of you. Um, if you uh, go to drink a cup of coffee, you get your coffee, like the classic American, you go to Starbucks, you get your uh, drip coffee or for me, my espresso shot. And then I get my uh uh, Georgia knows my coffee obsession. Um, it's mutual. And then you, yeah. <laughs> and then you get a uh, an ice water with it. And let's say they're in the two same cups. And you go to pick up your ice water, and then you realize it's coffee. You're kind of like, what the heck? What was this? Or vice versa. You go to pick up your coffee, and it's water. You're like trying to navigate what it. What does it yeah. mean that this tastes totally different? Yeah. And then I would say um, it's the same, this idea of what you thought it was going to be. And then it's not, but you're still going to chase that. You still want to get that coffee. You're going to go ahead and try it, but you're still like, Oh my God, I can't believe it was water. I can't believe it's coffee Yeah. or the same. You go to the fridge, you try to get a piece of chocolate cake out. You're watering. You're so excited, but your husband already ate that piece of chocolate cake. You're still going to try to get that chocolate cake Mm. because you really want it. It's, It's so exciting. Sugar. It's, it's uh, those same dopamine hits on a chemical basis. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, and then I hear so often too of like, and I totally did this, you know, years ago as well, but it's like, you know, you have that kind of internal knowing this isn't right. Mm-hmm. And then maybe it's like this idea that, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong with this, like an idea of like, oh, it just takes a lot of work and we work so hard on this. Like I should stay because we work so hard. And then you can throw in the person gaslighting you. Like, how do you, how do you like actually get the, I don't know, like navigate that to like get, I don't know if strength is the right word to like leave, to like actually be done and leave and walk away. Yeah. Well, I think that that's building, um, kind of a part of you that says well okay well one side of this is what would the most confident version of me do and kind of putting her him forward so yeah what when did I feel the most confident in my life when did I feel the most me and why can't I get that back and then kind of pushing that person forward but just going back to that little t versus big t trauma is navigating what are those reasons that are holding you back from leaving I mean, that gaslighting is so strong. It's so like, well, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe, maybe I'm the one that's messed up when that person is. So I would say the first step is saying, you know, I'm going to put myself into this person that I want to be. The second is going through some type of therapeutic intervention. They have a lot of evidence-based therapy, like um, it's called eye movement desensitization um, therapy, which basically, and, and reprocessing, which basically is going to go through the trauma and rewrite it so you can move forward in your future. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one way. And they say that it can go in any type of trauma. So they're, they're saying like, let's rewrite things so that when these free trauma experiences come up, we say, okay, I'm not going to deal with this. This is not me. This is not who I want to be. The hardest thing possible I want to add and gaslighting is horrible. I've been gaslit so much. I mean, you know, about some things we've talked about, it's just like, these things that we think are yeah. supposed to work. We think that they're perfect. We think that it's amazing art. Mm-hmm. And that's where the, we keep wanting it. We want mm-hmm. that. We want things to work. We want mm-hmm. them so bad to work. And then finally saying, 
I'm never going to find anything like that love bomb. I'm never going to find anything like this. You know, I'm not wanted. I'm never going to be wanted. And I can accept the bad of this person. But if you have a stable enough relationship, you have a stable sense of self, you're going to be able to work through that. Mm -hmm. That's what's important. Trusting yourself. Not so easy, you know? Yeah. Well, then it's so tough too with the kind of person that love bombs. They're also the kind of person at a party, like can work the room and is super yeah. charming. And so then, and then people are telling you how great they are. And so then you're like, okay, yeah, I guess I am just crazy. And like, I am a lot and yeah, it's, yeah, it's just like a whole other level of it. Well, and I will say it's not only what, what I, I mean, and I, I know we're talking about relationships here, but let's go to a bigger relationship here that we've never kind of, um, been a society to talk about which is our family relationships and what we grow up with it's like we grow up with these parents that tell us that we need to be perfect and we need to not be too much or like even going back to the baby baby boomer times where it says okay well why should you be dealing with mental health you know just solve it just put up with it drink a glass of wine take that beer and just kind of solve it on your own get chemically Mm -hmm. away from it but it's not a quick fix and that's still not solved. So I would say looking at what those attachment figures really gave you and being okay with the fact, like you're going to work through it. You're not stuck with this. And we always think things are permanent. Um, We always think our past means that we're this way and that we're too much. And, and we need to be more, we need to keep going. I mean, that's a very strong American value system um, with a lack of just accepting ourselves. This is who we're going to be. Yeah. That's really helpful hearing it from just kind of that bigger picture. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, with that, like, why, why is mental health so important? Yeah, a very good question. I mean, if we're not able to, I guess, navigate our day-to-day world, how are we going to be able to be there for ourselves? Mm-hmm. I guess that's mm-hmm. the biggest thing. I mean, if I go through my day, I feel like crap that day. Mm -hmm. And then just say I'm sitting on the computer or I'm uh, binging a Netflix show or something like that. Uh, Afterwards, you're going to feel great because you got that mindless time. But at the end of it, you're not really taking care of yourself and you're not talking about things. And and I think another thing, too, is that you'll see it come up in other areas. We see a lot of health anxiety just going like even your work is that what we'll see is there's um, a fear of like, okay, well, I don't I'm not I'm never going to get better. Something's really wrong with me or something's going to happen instead of saying, okay, well, what's the deeper meaning here? Yeah. And and then we see it come up in different areas. We get depressed, we get sad. We don't want to engage in our work. We live a mundane life. We, we don't want to be with our partners. We withdraw when, why not just engaging with those experiences? And the weirdest thing is we all think that everybody needs to know we go to therapy. And I think it's important to share and start that dialogue more. But what happens if we just don't feel we want to tell people we go to therapy? You don't need to tell your doctor that you go in and you get, uh, or your friends that you go to your doctor and you get insulin, unless yeah. you want to tell them. You don't want need to tell them that you're going in and you're celiac. I mean, unless you go for, you know, happy hour and you can't. I'm just thinking a lot about different things yeah. and you can eat that. But you don't need to tell people unless you want to talk about it with them. Those are your boundaries. You can talk about what you want to talk about and get professional help. And that person creates the room in a calming manner. So you can leave and you could say, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to feel like people are judging me. It's a Mm -hmm. confidential room. It's a safe Mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. I know I was talking to one of my (laughs) good girlfriends yesterday, who's just hilarious, but she was she's in the middle of planning a wedding. She's like, I don't know how people function without therapy. She's like, how would you just live day to day without? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so with that too, any tips um, as a therapist and someone who, you know, has such a great booming practice um, of like finding a good fit for you for a good yeah. fit for you. Yeah. Like as a therapist. Like you mean for the therapist to find a good client fit or for the client to find a good therapist? Client to find a good therapist. Yeah. So, I mean, I think one thing we do is we offer a complimentary free um, Mm -hmm. 15-minute consultation. Mm -hmm. Is this therapist going to work with me? Is is he or she going to be able to help me? 
and also know going in that you have the autonomy to leave. So yeah. doing that assessment, doing that interview, seeing if you can vibe well, I mean, you're not in the same wavelength. That doesn't mean you have to go back. doesn't yeah. mean that you have to go. But that's a common misconception here is that like, I have to go, I have to be okay with it and stay instead of saying that I'm allowed to have autonomy here. Yeah. Just like you can change your PC or your, um, your PCP or your medical doctor, you can change yeah. your therapist too. Yeah. Awesome. And so, um, thank you for all of this. This is so helpful. And tell us a little bit about your practice, how people can find you guys, all that. Yeah. Well, so our name of our practice is Ember. And that's because, uh, you know, after the years in Hungary, Ember means person. Um, hmm. So we had, we kind of died that with, and then Ember is the top of the fire um, is, is just to say that like, you are a person and you can kind of keep forward. So if you, if you kind of, our, our website is emberpsychotherapycollective.com and then you can schedule a free consult with a therapist. You can um, schedule a session. If you're feeling like you want to jump in, you can talk to our intake providers about what to do um, with getting set up and we're there for resources. Um, so I definitely think like email and online, um, they can email intake at Ember Psychotherapy and just kind of read our bios. Like we have mm-hmm. a bunch of bios on our website and you can read what's a good fit. Like yeah. some therapists work with like those different niches that I talked about and some don't, and that's okay. Yeah. Therapists want to make sure it's a fit for you. You're the person that's there. You're our yeah. Ember, so to speak, but oh. yeah, good full circle. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Cool. And I'll put that in the show notes for people. And yeah, is there like a good question or questions to like ask when you're kind of like interviewing your therapists? Yeah, I think it's giving a small spiel, so to speak, of what you want to work of and on and then ask them, do you think you can help? Do you think oh. that this is a good fit? I mean, but it's so so hard to think about that I know and then I think, yeah I'm like all this is so basic but like I don't I'm like oh yeah it's it, but it's so hard it's not how are you gonna know right like how are you gonna know to like ask that I think a lot of it is people go into these consults and want to sell themselves but it's for you like mm. your therapist is not going to judge you you were trained in school to be less judgmental we're trained to leave our crap at the door and be present with you and if your therapist isn't able to do that then that's on them that has nothing to do with you and they will be transparent with you about it um like on our practice we're always having case um reflections of how to improve and i think also asking when you do these consults or these interviews like are you talking about um, are you learning new things? Or if I come up with you with a new problem, are you going to be able to handle that? So Mm -hmm. another thing here. Cool. Amazing. Well, Mara, thank you so much. You're awesome. This was super insightful and I'm I'm sure everyone listening has learned a ton. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be on here and to know you and to continue, you know, being collaborating together and being friends and yeah. (laughs) <laughs> me too thanks for being my well, friend <laughs> thanks for being my friend <laughs> crazy therapist next door but <laughs> not at all thanks Mara thanks